dinosaurs. The meteorite was likely over nine miles across, enough to cause utter devastation across the whole planet. It exploded with the force of 100 million, million tons of TNT. The blast sent a giant plume of vaporized rock out into space. A crater was punched half a mile into the Earth's crust. It was above this rim of weakened rock that this cenote is formed. The blast would have been ferocious. But it was what happened next that made the impact a global catastrophe. The blast plume that shot into space fell back to Earth. Many believe that billions of molten particles superheated the air to hundreds of degrees. Fires swept the planet, choking the atmosphere with soot and dust. The dinosaurs and most other creatures were doomed. But fortunately, underground, there were some survivors. It took a few million years, but eventually conditions on Earth returned to normal. By wiping out the dinosaurs, the impact cleared the way for the rise of a new type of animal, the mammals, and ultimately, for humans. So from our point of view, this global disaster turned out to be no bad thing. Catastrophes like the Chicxulub meteorite are disastrous for the life that happens to be around at the time. But in terms of stimulating the evolution of complex life, they're actually a blessing in disguise. The extinction of the dinosaurs wasn't the only time that a catastrophe kick-started a major evolutionary change. In the Italian Dolomites, geological evidence shows how the dinosaurs themselves benefited from a previous catastrophe. This layer of black rock marks a time when 70% of all life on land perished. Over 90% of marine life died out. And when it was over, it was the dinosaurs that inherited the Earth. And in Australia, it's possible to see the last survivors of an even earlier catastrophe. These mounds are bacterial stromatolites. They might still rule the Earth today were it not for a colossal ice age which nearly wiped them out, clearing the way for the first complex life. Earth has been blessed with just the right balance of stability and the occasional catastrophe. Too many catastrophes and life never gets a chance to develop. Too few and life gets stuck in a rut. It's taken four and a half billion years to turn the Earth from a barren rock into the world we see today. It's been a remarkable journey. But now the planet's facing perhaps its greatest challenge. Humans. Just look at Earth from space. At night, our lights mark out our domination of the world.
By burning fossil fuels like coal and gas, we've changed the very composition of the atmosphere, and with it, the climate. The human race now moves more rock and soil on the surface of the planet than all the Earth's natural processes put together. No species has ever dominated the planet like this. In fact, our influence is now so great that many scientists believe a new geological era has begun. The Anthropocene, the human era. The question is, are we now beginning to threaten the very conditions that make our planet so special? A good place to find out is here on the island of Madagascar, off the coast of Africa. It's estimated that 85% of all life here is unique to this island. Most of it is found in the forests Madagascar is famous for. These forests symbolize the way our planet works. They're incredibly complex, and yet everything works together to maintain the health of the whole system. And just like the whole planet, we're changing the forests here without fully understanding the consequences. I've joined up with a science expedition to see for myself what's happening to Madagascar's forests. Good. All right, guys, here we are. All right, there we Dr. go. Dr. Brian All Fisher right. is cataloging the life found in the forests to help understand how the delicate ecosystem is changing. Well, this is it. This is the end of the road for the vehicles. We're heading off on foot now, down there, into the jungle. Brian's team is searching for a new species that he's convinced lurk in the undergrowth. He believes it's a particularly good area for ants. And they live in rotting wood. They live in the ground. They live under stones. And we're just trying to peek into their homes, you know, get onto their level. Check this out. There are cocoons oh, wow. there. Look at that. The yellow cocoons. Look at that. Yes. And I'm sure this is a new species. A new this, species of ant? Yep, new species in the genus Serapakis. Oh, look at them all. The whole nest structure is right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh look at that. Look at them all. So you only find these ants in a place that's, that's got a lot of biodiversity, it's unique. Right, you can't support this on a marginal habitat because they require, underneath it, a whole system of interactions to be happening. Look at that one stinging me right now. Oh, look at that. It's an encouraging find. The fact that this part of the forest is teeming with insect life means that here, at least, it's still pretty healthy. And by convention, whoever discovers a new species gets to give it a name. In a very generous gesture, Brian chose to name the new ant after me. Say hello to Serapacus Ian Stewarty. Bit of a mean-looking critter, if you ask me. 